From the valleys of ancient Israel to the streets of our cities, the stories of David echo through the ages, reminding us that courage, resilience, and the power of redemption are timeless. Our story intertwines with the stories of those around us, weaving a tapestry of shared experiences, challenges, and triumphs, all serving as a beacon of light in our darkest night. But beyond these narratives of old lies a deeper truth. We find a foreshadowing of a greater shepherd, a redeemer who would come to usher humanity towards salvation and eternal life. Well, it is great to be with you today. My name is Eric, and I'm the executive pastor here. And I have the ultimate privilege of being able to oversee our staff and our ministries, incredible staff and ministries. And I had the privilege uh, with Jennifer of being on our newest uh, partner in Italy with Justice and Mercy International, a trip with them last week. And our senior pastor, Jeff Simmons, is on sabbatical till August 4th. And part of his sabbatical was being in one of our JMI partners in Moldova last week. And let me just encourage you by saying, God is at work all around the world. It's amazing. And it's because of your prayer support, your financial support, all the different ways that we as a church support. So thank you for that. Be encouraged. I want to welcome all of you that are here at our Franklin campus. Great to have you here on this uh, back half of the 4th of July weekend. I want to welcome everybody online as well. It may be that you're in Moldova or Italy, or it may just be that you're, you're at the beach for a holiday or for vacation. Whatever the case is, we're so glad that you've uh, chosen to worship with, worship with us online here at Rolling Hills. So we are continuing on with our series in David and uh, the life of David, our master class series. Before I get into the kind of the gist of the message, I do want to ask an opening question of you. Can you think of a definitive moment from your childhood? Can you think of a time, can you recall a time that shaped you early on into parts of who you are and what you believe for the rest of your life? I had a moment like that. I was about five years old. I was with my mom at the stop-and-go convenience store in Elgin, Illinois. We were checking out, and I asked her if I could have a candy bar. Not just any candy bar, a whatchamacallit. Anybody remember whatchamacallit? I mean, the best. And she said, no, you've had too much candy today. She was probably right. But when she wasn't looking, I took that candy bar and I shoved it in my pocket. We hopped in the Chevelle. We drove back home. Just when I thought I was in the clear, I pulled that whatchamacallit out, and she says, what are you doing? I was busted. And I said, I really wanted the candy bar. She said, okay, you can have it. No, 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 no. She didn't. None of that. We got back in the Chevelle, drove back to stop and go, and I had to give that whatchamacallit back to the clerk. One of the most embarrassing, humiliating moments of my life. I was only five, but it, but it scarred me for the rest of my life. But I learned a lesson. You know, you, your sin will always find you out. I, I'm kind of a little bit of a crime junkie. You know, 2020, Dateline, cold cases. I don't know if we have any fans of that. I always wonder, like, how do these people think they're going to get away with this? They might for a little while, but ultimately, your sin finds you out. And then, don't even get me started on stupid criminals. Y'all, there are some stupid people out there, right? <laughs> I mean, there was this guy, Matt and Phil, and Matt and Phil would rob different places, and instead of like having a mask or a disguise, they'd take a black permanent marker and put it all over their face. Probably worked for the moment where they were somewhat disguised, but as soon as the cops started looking for them, they're like, uh, there they are, right there. It was permanent after all, or at least it lasted a long time. They actually had the nickname, were given the nickname Dumb and Dumber for a reason. And then there's Ruben Zarate in 2008 in my home city of Chicago. He decided he was going to rob a muffler shop. So he goes in to rob the muffler shop, and the employee says, hey, uh, I can't get into the, into the safe. Only my manager can do that. So Ruben, being really bright, he writes down his cell phone number. He says, well, call me when the manager's in. <laughs> they called him. He came ready to rob the store, and the cops were there ready for him. Your sin always 
finds you out. And the Bible actually has a lot to say about sin as well, and the fact that your sin will always find you out. Now, I know for some of us listening today or watching today, sin's a tough topic, man. I mean, I've talked to Christ followers and non-Christ followers that really, really struggle with the concept of sin. You know, they want to focus on, on the good news of Jesus, his grace and his mercy and his love. And believe me, I do too. That's the part I really like. But if we're going to accept the scriptures that talk about his grace and his mercy and his love, we have to accept the parts of scripture that also talk about sin. You see, without bad news, there is no good news. We're in our summer series on David, the Life of David Masterclass. And we're seeing his story and our story. And we're looking into all the incredible aspects of David life, David's life, who was dubbed a man after God's own heart. Today, I drew, I drew the short straw, and I'm talking about one of the toughest angles of David's life, his sin. In fact, his affair with Bathsheba and his subsequent murder of her husband, Uriah, I mean, probably one of the most infamous sins in all of the Bible and all of human history for that matter. It does end good, though. Let me give you that precursor, all right? So let's start today by looking at the story itself from 2 Samuel. And let me just say this. The story is for every one of us. Whether you're younger or older, whether you're single or you're married, whether you're here in the room, you're watching online, it's for all of us. God wants, to be, wants you to be strengthened today in your walk with the Lord. He wants you to be encouraged. So with that in mind, let me encourage you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you don't have Bibles today, uh, here in Franklin, we've got Bibles on the back tables there every week as our gift for you. We also have the Rowan Hills Church Center app. That's where I'm going to be reading the scripture, and you can download that app uh, online as well and follow along, and there'll be scriptures on the screen as well. And let me encourage you to take notes, either on the app or in your worship guide, because study after study shows you can retain, learn, and apply more if you take notes during a message, all right? So first point I really want us to think through today is this. We all need to realize and recognize that sin always deceives, traps, and destroys. The Bible never flatters its heroes. It doesn't ignore, deny, or overlook the dark side of our biblical heroes. And sometimes that's tough to swallow, to know what happened in David's life, to know what happened in Moses' life and others. But it should encourage us to know that even the best men and women in biblical record had their faults and failures, just as I do, just as we all do. And the sovereign Lord in his grace was able to use those sins, those faults, those failures to accomplish his purposes. And we have to admit, right, like none of us, think about your secret sins. None of us want those up on the big screen, do we? None of us want those out on social media let alone in the most popular book in the history of mankind and making movies and having people talk about for generations and generations. But that's what's happening here with David. David's sin has had that type of exposure. No sin save the sin of Adam and Eve has received more press than David and Bathsheba. So again, you probably know the gist of the story, but let's dig into it. I'm going to look at it kind of a verse by verse here. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, when it says there in the spring, it literally means um, at the turn of the year. See, the ancient Hebrew calendar year turned in April when the land began to dry out after the big winter heavy rains. And kings avoided war during the heavy rains, but they stored up their stockpiles of resources. They put their strategies together. So they were prepped and ready to go. So when spring came, they were ready to attack and ready to take new ground. And this was a part of history, or this was a time in the history of Israel when they had great military success against the, against the Ammonites, who were their arch enemies at the time. Now it also says here in verse one, that David remained in Jerusalem. Now, we don't know why that's in there, except it's a very important part of the story. We don't know why he remained there, though. <clears throat> it could have been he was watching his 80-inch TV and drinking a cold one and watching a game. I don't know. It could have been that he really trusted Joab to lead the army. We do, we, what we do know is this is the first time in biblical recorded history of the king not going out with his army. Keep that in mind as we move on to verse 2. 
One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the palace, walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a beautiful, or he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now, it was not uncommon for men or women to take naps during this time. And that's what this was. Late afternoon, early evening, taking a little bit of a siesta, getting ready for a, a long evening, a long night ahead. And so that's why I know David was called a man after God's own heart. He took naps, right? You know, there's only two and two kinds of people in this world, those that love naps and those that don't. How many are my nap, lo nap lovers out there, huh? Oh, I see the halos around you. How many are not? How many are not nap takers? Yeah, we'll pray for y'all. All right. <laughs> David was a nap taker. He got up, went out to the rooftop deck. Imagine being downtown Nashville on the rooftop restaurant, kind of looking out over the city. And Israel at that time, with his palace and also with regular, regular homes, rooftops were flat. They were regularly used, regularly used for drying and storing produce, strolling around, socializing, even sleeping in warm weather. And as one version points out, as he looked out over the city, he saw this beautiful woman. Now, note that the temptation and sin isn't always something we're going to look for. Oftentimes, it comes finding us. And the issue is we're not prepared for it when it comes looking for us. So here he is. David's looking out over the city. He sees this beautiful woman taking a bath. And this is the moment when David had a chance. Danger, danger is calling out right now. David had a chance. He had a choice. We'll talk about this in a minute. But God tells us that when we are tempted, he will provide a way out. This was the moment of temptation. And David had a choice to make. Now, you may ask, why was she in plain view? To be honest with you, we don't know. Some people think she knew what she was doing. Others think she thought everybody was asleep. She could have just been trying to get cooled down. We don't know. But in any, in any case, there she was. And we move on to verse 3. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. See, Bathsheba's grandfather was one of David's advisors. And David would have known Uriah for sure as well. He was one of the 30, which were David's mightiest men. I think, think the leaders of the special forces in the army or the leaders of the Navy SEALs in the Navy. I mean, these, this was an important guy. He knew him, but they blew right past this warning as well. Verse 4, then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and she slept with him and he slept with her. Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness, and then she went back home. David made his choice. He made his choice. Do we know if she was a willing participant or he used his, his you know, uh, place as king to have this relationship consummate? We don't know. The culture is so different from <clears throat> where our brains are today. It's hard to completely know. But in any case, David made a choice, and he thought he got away with it. He didn't. Verse 5, the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Sin always has consequences. In this case, there's a baby on the way. Now, we just read in verse 4, it's kind of weird, right? Talking about that time of the month, like the menstrual period. Why is that in scripture? Well, it's important because Uriah, her husband, had been out in the battlefield. And so because she got her period, the baby could not have been Uriah's. It had to be David's. Sin always has consequences. In this case, there's a baby on the way. Verses 6 through 8. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, how the war was going. <laughs> Making small talk to the guy he just slept with his wife. Crazy, right? Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king, maybe champagne or something, and was sent after him. Again, our first point today is that we all need to realize and recognize that sin always traps and deceives and destroys. And we see the effects of that right here. David could have come clean. He could have confessed. But the sin goes deeper. The sin goes darker. And he devises a plan to cover it up now. Verses 9 through 11. 
But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all the master servants and did not go down to the house. David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why don't you go home? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. David's plan didn't work. He picked the wrong guy. He was one of the 30. He was a committed, dedicated soldier. He was a man of utmost integrity and character. It gets worse. 12 and 13, then David said to him, stay here one more day. I'm going to try again. And tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat again among his master's servants. He did not go home. Cover up, take two. It still didn't work. And David is getting desperate now, right? And what do desperate people do? They do desperate things. Can you think about a time when a sin, a fault, something you said or did was uncovered or about to be uncovered? And you get that pit in your stomach, right? Maybe some, some cold sweats. You know, I, I think of a time years ago where I had a, a volunteer that had dropped the ball a big ball the umpteenth, for the umpteenth time. I don't even know if umpteenth is a word, but that's how many times this guy dropped the ball. And so I did what I shouldn't have done, but to my staff, I just sent off a fiery email. This guy dropped the ball again, blah, blah, blah. Now, here's a friend of mine. I should have gone to him. I should have talked to him. I should have the gumption to go and share with him what was on my heart and what I was feeling, but I didn't. Bum, 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 and I hit send. I went, and went on about my business for a few minutes, And then it dawned on me, Uh uh-oh, I think he was on that email list. So I pulled it up and I started looking, going through the contacts. Yes, he was on that email list. Oh, the pit in my stomach. You know, I felt just awful. And later on, I tried to apologize to him. I tried to make things right. And he was a gracious man. But I got to admit, even though he's a friend of mine and we're a friend to this day, it was never quite the same As a pastor, I've heard for decades from men in particular about how they felt when an affair or a pornography addiction or something like that was uncovered or discovered. It's a daunting moment. And here's David times 100, times 1,000, times 10,000. 14 and 15, it goes on. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in the front where the fighting is the fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. The gall, he sends a death notice to Joab about Uriah through Uriah. But he knew he trusted him. He knew he wouldn't read the letter. He would just take it to Joab. See, David moves to the ultimate cover-up moment, murder. It's like when I'm watching a 2020 or Dateline and my wife Rachel's watching with me and she goes, why do they always have to kill the spouse? Why do they always have to kill the girlfriend or boyfriend? Why not just divorce them or leave them? And she's right, right? Sometimes it's financial, but other times it's just being the ultimate throes of cover-up and desperation. Now let me pause here for just a second. <clears throat> with a crowd this size in Franklin and with the number of people watching online, I'd be remiss if I didn't think that there was someone or some ones that are here in the sound of my voice that are considering a cover-up of some sin or in the midst of a cover-up of some sin, maybe a sexual sin, it may be some financial indiscretion, maybe something said or not said. Please learn a lesson from David. Don't do it. Don't do it. We'll talk about how in a minute. Now, in verses 16 through 27, <clears throat> we're not going to talk about these today. We're not going to read these today, but uh, it's how Uriah died in battle and then how David subsequently took Bathsheba as his wife. He was kind of a hero. Oh, one of my mighty men died, so I'm going to take his wife as my wife. For time's sake, you can read about that later. But then we go to the very end of the chapter, the last sentence. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. 
See, your, your sin will always find you out. Even if you get away with it on this earth, the Lord knows, and it displeases him. God knows. He knows the, the current sin you're in. He, he knows the ones you'll do tomorrow, the ones from your past. Don't worry. We're going to get to the grace and mercy part because that's the good part, right? Trust me, we're going to go there. But for right now, we just need the gravity of David's sin and our sin to just sink in. Okay, turn to a neighbor and share your secret sin real quick, if you would. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. It's getting a little too heavy there for a minute, so I had to, had to lighten it up, okay? Now, we, before we move on to some of the other points of the, of the, of the talk here, uh, a couple of notes here. David was 50 years old. So he had been in uh, charge, he had been the king for 20 years, and we just have to take heed, whether we're in our 20s, 40s, 60s, 70s, no one is ever too young or old to fall. Do you know that this was the only time David was mentioned in the Bible, or the only David mentioned in the Bible over a thousand times? He's the man, okay? He had distinguished himself as a man of God, a composer of Psalms, a faithful shepherd, a valiant warrior on the battlefield, and a leader of his people. Jesus, one of Jesus' names was actually son of David. See, we're not looking at a sexual pervert or, or a wild rebel or anything like that. He would have been a standout citizen here in Williamson County or in Murray County or in Davidson County. This was a sin from a godly man and a leader of his community. Second point that I want us to really think through is this. We need to be prepared for our temptation moments and protect ourselves from them protect ourselves from temptation when it comes our way. Remember in verse 2, the temptation found David, and he had a choice to make. And his choice was to act on the temptation. There's another biblical giant that we see in Genesis 39, Joseph. Joseph had the power over all of Egypt. He reported just to Potiphar, and all of a sudden one day, Potiphar's wife, who was also beautiful, pulls him into her room. And unlike David's temptation of like overlooking the city and seeing a woman bathing, Potiphar's wife is there grabbing a hold of him and saying, come have sex with me, come sleep with me. David succumbed to the temptation. What did Joseph do? He ran. He ran. In fact, he ran so fast, he left his coat behind and later on ended up getting him in trouble. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says this. No temptation is overtaken. You accept what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. See, we need to run as fast as we can like Joseph did and know that God is going to help us in our temptation. Now, I need, do need to share for a second that 1 Corinthians 10.13 is talking about temptation. The temptation is the battle of the mind. Temptation is not a sin, it's a test. So if you're an alcoholic, it doesn't mean hopping in your car, driving to the bar, ordering a drink, and having that shot glass being lifted up to your mouth, that that's when God says he's gonna inter intervene. He might, because God is God. But the promise here is before you get in the car. It's the battle of the mind. What is it that's the battle of your mind? What are those areas that you know the evil one likes to work? Is it in the area of, of sexual indiscretion or pornography? Is it fantasy thoughts, pride, a lying tongue, anger, drunkenness, financial indiscretions, gossip, laziness? We have to realize there are four key ways to be prepared for temptation when it comes to us, and it will. You know, we have to realize that we are all vulnerable. I mean, look at pastors that you hear about that fall all the time. It's horrible. Politicians, actors, actresses, athletes, and people just like you and me. We have an enemy that wants to destroy our relationship with God and our influence for God and really wants to destroy our society. And I believe that in the whole sexual arena that we're talking about today, it's probably his number one toy box. See, God created us in Genesis 3 as male and female to have sex in the covenant of marriage. And any sexual act that is outside of God's plan displeases him, just like what David did displeased him. That means as a single person, a one-night stand, or sex with someone you're dating but not married to, 
It means sex outside of God's plan for a male and a female. If you're married, it means sex outside of marriage. And we're all vulnerable in this area. 1 Corinthians 6 and many other passages say to flee from sexual immorality. And that means sex outside of God's design. Satan attacks and uses the same tricks he did in Genesis 3 and with David as he does today. And I believe the top tools he's using are media and pornography. I mean, just a couple of quick stats. 47% of the U.S. say that porn is in their home. 68% of church-going men and 90% of non-church-going men have viewed porn in the last month. Women are a part of this as well. 33% of women 25 and under search for porn at least once a month. See, the, the sin of David is a warning to us all. Y'all, God loves you. He wants your best life. He wants you to have a great marriage if you're called to that. He wants you to have great sex within marriage. It's his idea. These are all his words, not my words. But just like if you're a parent, he gives us a warning. And that's what he's doing here. Pastor Jeff, our senior pastor, told a story a while back, about a true story, about a man who was in, run, in, the, running of the, in the street of the running of the bull, bulls in Pampelona, Spain, and he's taken a selfie in the midst of the stampede, and a bull gorged him, and he almost died. And sometimes I feel like that's what we do as a society and as Christian men and women in the area of sex. We kind of disregard it, and we feel like, oh, it's okay, I'm going to take a selfie in the middle of a stampede. And we know the Big Ten. David knew the Big Ten, right? That do not commit adultery is one of those, but he had complete disregard because he was so blinded by his sin. We also need to make being in God's word and prayer a daily priority. We need food to survive each day, and we need God's daily bread to survive each day. I encourage you, jump into Daily Step. It's on our Church Center app. We're reading through the Bible together uh, in a year as the church. If that's too daunting, just pick a few verses or a couple of chapters, you know, each day. John Piper says this. He's a noted author and scholar, pastor. I know of no other way to triumph over sin long-term than to gain a distaste for it because of a superior satisfaction in God. That superior satisfaction with God comes from knowing him and being with him. And y'all, we have the time. Do we have the commitment? Do we recognize the urgency do you know how much time we spend on social media scrolling? A lot. Do you know the average person reads over 265 social media posts, texts, and emails every day just on their phones or tablets? See, Martin Luther years ago said, I've got so much to do today, I've got to spend an extra hour in prayer. We do the opposite, right? We've got so much to do today, we need to skip our devotional, skip our time with the Lord. You may not have time for the extra hour, but you can cry out, God, help me. God, lead me today. David didn't do that. We don't see that in Scripture. Now, I'll cut you a deal, okay? Let's play. Let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. On the days that you're not tempted, you can skip Bible reading and prayer. How does that sound, all right? Sound like a deal? What about Jesus when he was tempted? What did he do? He turned to Scripture, and he's our model. We also need to have prayer partners and community that you can turn to. Could be family members, community group friends, mentors. You know, I've called people in my life when I've been in struggles. Hey, man, I'm being tempted. I'm going through a tough season. Can you pray for me? I've had people that have called me as well. If you're going through something later on today or tomorrow or this week, do you have somebody that you can call? Is this still a thing, by the way, this whole phone thing? Do you have somebody that you can call? If not, hop into one of our community groups that are coming up here in August for our new ministry year, our new school year. And if you're a community group leader, please, 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 please live out 2 Thessalonians 5.17. It says this, we loved you so much, we are delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well because you've become so dear to us. I love Bible study. I love curriculum. I love reading. I love video, you know, watching video messages. I love podcasts. But we need to be in biblical community. And we call our groups men's community groups and women's community groups and mixed community groups for a reason. There's Bible study that's a part of it, but that's one part. It's also our lives as well. So when temptation comes, when struggles come, you can call somebody and somebody's there for you. Jump into a group, 
I pray. The last piece here is have an exit plan. You know your sin. You know your temptations. Encourage you to make sure that you allow your friend or your spouse to look at your phone if you're having issues with porn. If an image pops up or you get a weird Instagram, block it out. If you're a road warrior and travel a lot, so many temptations. Have exit plans. Know what to do if you're approached at the bar and a restaurant. Run. I have a friend of mine, Huntley, and he travels for a living. And what he does is he gets to a hotel room, opens up the door, gets on his knees, and he prays for that hotel room that it would be purified, that he'd be closer to the Lord as a result. Then he pulls out a little plaque that's got a verse from Job that says, I'll put no unwholesome thing before my eyes. And he puts it on top of his TV. Have an exit plan. The third point I want us to really think through today is this. We all need to fight the inclination to cover up sin. See, what you feed grows and what you starve dies. Sometimes, you know, as we cover up things, we're feeding that sinful nature. We need to starve it out. We need to confess it. It's also not okay to say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do this because God's a God of mercy and a God of grace and he's going to forgive me. I hate to say it, but that's a, that's a cheap grace. I mean, our Jesus took our sin on the cross. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us, we should respond, not cover up or justify. We have a choice just like David did. David sinned and made a bad choice. He then compounded it tenfold, a hundredfold with his bad choices. Don't follow his lead. Learn from it. And that's the fourth point. We finally turned a corner to the grace and the mercy because we need to learn from our failures. Finally, later on in life, David realized all the garbage in his life. His eyes were open. He realized his sin, his mistakes, the path that it took him on. Now, you're going to hear more about this next week from our associate teaching pastor, Mike Minter, as he talks about David and Nathan and their story. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention for just a moment that David did learn from his failures. Turn with me, if you would, to the Psalms. You see, when you look at the Psalms, we're really looking into an inside look at David's journal, if you will. So a couple of verses that come to mind here in Psalm 51, when he realized what he had done. Verse 1, have mercy, Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. He realized what had happened. Down to verse 3, for I know my transgressions now. My sins, it's always before me. Down to verse 7, cleanse me, God, with the hyssop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. I know you can do it, God. Verse 9, Hide your face from my sins, from all the craziness that I was a part of, and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit from within me. And then verse 13, I know you're going to do all this for me, God. And then when you do, I'm going to teach transgressors your ways, and so that sinners will turn back to you. And, and, you know, sometimes you'll see in a movie where somebody falls off a boat or they've got to swim back to shore and they're calling out to God, God, if you get me back to shore, I'm going to do all these things. And then they don't do it. Well, well, David's kind of doing that here in verse 13. But let's jump ahead to chapter 66. You're going to like this. 66. Because what happens is David follows through. And he says, I told, I told you, God, I was going to tell people. If you saved me, I was going to tell people. Verse 16 of Psalm 66, 15 chapters later. Come in here, all you who fear God, and let me tell you what God has done for me. He followed through on his promise to God. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You ever feel like your prayers kind of hit the ceiling? Like there's a disconnect between you and God? David felt that way. It was because of his cherished sin. But God, I love those words. But God, but God has surely listened and heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. See, when David committed adultery and then covered it up by having Uriah murdered, did, did he deserve to be forgiven? No way. No way. Did he deserve, did David deserve mercy? No way. But David knew that God is a good God. And so later on, when he realized his transgressions, he asked for mercy. And here's the deal, friends. We can take that same confessional path today. I hope you just do it more quickly than David did, right? And let me just say the confession is so much more freeing and transformational than discovery. Your sin will find you out. 
It'll be discovered or you'll confess it. And when we confess, it's so much more freeing and transformational. That brings me to our last point, David and me. We need to see David's story in our story. Just like David was chosen, you've been chosen. He was chosen to be king. You've been chosen to live your life that you are called to right now for such a time as this. You're here for a purpose. He chose you. Don't you forget that. God doesn't choose perfect people. He chooses people with flaws and struggles and regrets. Sometimes those regrets, I got to admit, sometimes they stick with us for a while. Much like the guy that got this tattoo. No regrets. <laughs> Today you have an opportunity, you have a choice. Commit your life fully to Jesus. Pursue him first. Are there any areas in your life we you believe God might be displeased? Jesus wants the best life for you. And when David was following the Lord, the Lord was blessing him. You need to confess your sins and turn back to God if there's something like that that's going on. And David had a few times in his life when he had a choice to make. It wasn't until much later on that he made the right choice. Before then, he had many regrets. Let there be no regrets for you today. You have a choice to make. I pray that it's to live fully for him. I want to close with just a couple of lines from one of my favorite Christian artists, Ann Wilson, in her song, My Jesus. It might apply to some of us today. Are you, are you past the point of weary? Is your burden way, weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you have that empty feeling because shame's done all its stealing and you're desperate for some healing? Well, he makes a way where there is no way rises up from an empty grave. There ain't no sinner that he can't save. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is that he can do for you what he's done for me and for David. And let my Jesus change your life. Who, who, can, wait, who can wipe away the tears from the broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? Who can take my cross to Calvary and pay the price for all my guilty? Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. He rises up from an empty grave. There ain't no sinner that he can't save. His love is strong. His grace is free. And the good news is that I know that he can do for you what he's done for me and for David. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And friends, let my Jesus change your life. And that change may come in one of a couple of ways. It may be one you've never asked for your past and current sins to be forgiven and asked Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. And this may be your day to do that. Or it might be that there's a conviction about a present or past sin area of life that you know you need to confess, that you're displeasing God in that area. And this may be your day for that. I'm going to lead us in prayer. And as I do that, I encourage you to be open and honest with the Lord about where you are. Let's pray. God, we come before you recognizing that you have created us in your image as a relational God. We thank you for that. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy that we don't deserve. It's not just David that doesn't deserve it. We don't deserve it either. Right now, Lord, I pray for those that are in the sound of my voice that have never prayed to receive you as Jesus, as Savior and Lord, have never put their trust and faith in you. And right now, I pray that they would confess their sins to you and ask you to come into their life as Savior, Lord, and King in this very moment. I pray also for those of us that are convicted by sins that are going on in our life, by struggles that we know the evil one has a stronghold on. I pray that we would come clean and confess to say what you already know. And we know in your grace and mercy, even if we don't deserve it, you're going to free us from that. So we thank you for the opportunity to come before you as a good God. And we thank you in advance for how you're going to change our lives and make us more like Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen.